also with us is Dr. Singh from Cardi, who is the person behind this initiative. Um, without further ado, we're going to please invite Dr. Dunkley for her presentation. While we wait on Dr. Dunkley to share her screen, some little housekeeping. Please, guys, try to keep your mics muted. And you can use the chat to enter any questions or raise your hands at the end of the seminar so that we can address your questions. Also, we would like to welcome participants from throughout the Caribbean. I see we have a number of countries represented here, and I wish to welcome all of you to this a uh, series on backyard poultry production, particularly aimed at increasing table egg production in the Bahamas and the region. Dr. Dunkley, are you ready? Are you hearing me? Yes, Doc, we can hear you. Yes, sorry. You need to share your, your, your screen on your computer. I um I had it sharing and just had it blacked out, but no, it's not. Are you seeing it? We are seeing your cursor moving, but we're not seeing your PowerPoint presentation. Hmm. Just a second. Uh, see it is all right have you seen it now yes okay sorry about that okay so it's nice to be here again um continuing from where we left off or giving some more information on, on um, small flock layer production. Um, today I'll speak to you about laying an egg because of course, if you're gonna be growing a layer flock, it's good for you to know exactly how an egg is laid. So we'll start by looking at the female reproductive system. And we'll only look at the female reproductive system today because um, an, a hen will lay an egg whether or not a rooster is around. So we really, since we're not talking about hatching chicks today, we're just talking about laying an egg, we'll only be looking at the female reproductive system. All right, so that avian hen reproductive system, when a chick is born, they have two reproductive sides, right? So there's a left ovary and a left oviduct and a right ovary and a right oviduct, but only the left side will develop. So only the left ovary and left oviduct will develop. And maturation and ovulation of a single egg will occur day after day. Another thing about the avian reproductive system is that the follicle does not form a corpus luteum after ovulation takes place as what occurs with mammals. So the, the follicle is not um, going to be releasing any hormones or anything like that. It's just there for that development and maturation of that ovum or that yolk. Another thing about avian reproduction is that the avian spermatozoa can actually stay inside of a, a hen and remain viable for up to two weeks in that reproductive tract. 
So that's the only thing we'll speak about the, the rooster. Now, the reproductive system of a domestic hen is divided into two parts. We have the ovary and the oviduct. And this um, diagram that I have here, this is actually a picture of, uh, of a actual reproductive tract that we removed from a bird. And down here, this would be the ovary and the rest of it is the, is the oviduct. And again, typically only the left ovary and oviduct will develop in that mature hen. So for the first 14 to 15 weeks in a, in a female chick's life, nothing much is really happening in the reproductive system. But at about that 15 week mark, the hypothalamic pituitary axis in the brain of that bird starts to mature. And one thing about um, birds too, is that they are photostimulated by long day length. And what that means is that light is required for them to get that message for egg production to begin, or light is required for them to be sexually matured. And when they are stimulated at this time, the secondary sexual characteristics will start to grow. So the ovaries and the oviduct will start to develop. They'll develop us um, different types of feathers, they start putting on more weight and the female, the female um, pullet has to be at an approximate body weight before they can actually respond to that long day length, right? So proper nutrition is very important and any, any um, broiler breeder producers will, will tell you that yes, the birds have to be at a certain body weight before you want them before they, they actually continue to develop sexually. And the, the breed, the body weight will depend on the breed of birds that you're dealing with. Okay, my screen is stuck. Okay. So on this um, diagram I have here, I don't know why this is there, but on this diagram that I have here, it's just showing you that internal um, changes that will initiate that egg production. So here we have light and it can be natural light, right? that's the sunlight, or it can be artificial light. So that light reacts on the hypothalamus and produces the first hormone. And that hormone is called the gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH. That's how we refer to it, GNRH. And that hormone is released to the anterior pituitary, which is right below the, the, the base of the hypothalamus. And the anterior pituitary then go ahead and starts to release other hormones the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. Those are the two second ones, right? The FSH and the LH. And those hormones are in turn released to the ovary and the ovary then begins to grow. And based on the growth of the ovary, the ovary then release estrogen, progesterone and androgen. And that makes the oviduct start growing. So if you remember from the, the first slide where I showed you the, um, the ovary and the oviduct, they are two separate organs really, but they come together to make that reproductive tract of that um, female bird. And you have a cascade of hormones from the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, the ovary, the hormones cascades and um, all that, those hormones end up making that oviduct begin to grow. Okay, so some practical considerations or some things that you should consider is that 
you can actually delay that onset of late, right? So if your birds are not at the right size, you can delay them beginning to lay. And for the most part, you would want to delay that onset of lay beyond 20 weeks old, right? Because the eggs are very small before the birds are 21 weeks old. And this, of course, depends on the breed of birds. So for your, your, your um, leghorn, which is the, those white layers that they lay a lot of eggs, they start, they can start laying as early as 18 weeks old, but you might want to delay them a little bit because you want the eggs to be a little bigger. Now the, the brown egg birds, they, and depending on the breed too, they, um, they call some of them brown leghorns, but they are really a mix between leghorn and, and the Rhode Island red or the New Hampshire red. They, you want to delay those birds to lay, start laying at about 21, 22 weeks old too. And remember, day length stimulates their reproductive system or light, any light. So they need more than 12 hours of light per day in order to, to um, be reproducing. And it needs to be constant or increasing day length during the laying period, right? So you never want to decrease the day length on birds that's reproductively active. You'll, you'll um, inadvertently push them into a mold. And we'll talk about mold, I think, the next, um, on Wednesday. So you'll hear more about how that day length influences that bird. And also, orange and red colors are typically the most stimulatory for reproduction. So if you're using artificial light, you would want to use the warmer lights than the cooler, the cooler lights. Okay, so here we have a, a picture of an actual ovary and we have a computer animated one and I'll be using some computer animated um, pictures to explain the ovary. So look at it carefully. If you notice, you see some very small white eggs there or ovum and you see some small yellows and then you see these large ones and it's, it's replicated there in that um, animated version too. So in showing you those pictures, I'm gonna to talk to you about follicular development or maturation. Now, most leghorn hens will lay about 260 eggs per year. Now, when a chick is born, that female chick, they'll have about 12,000 follicles but they'll actually only produce about 500 eggs during their reproductive um, life, right? So not you're not gonna get 12,000 eggs from a bird. You'll get about 500, depending on how long you, you actually keep them. The follicles that do not reach that stage where they'd be ovulated, they are reabsorbed into the body. So about, 1% of the follicles will actually develop into an egg. Follicular hierarchy is very important when it comes to the, the um, ovulation of these ova. So they consist of prehierarchical follicles, which would be those very small, sorry, which would be those very small white follicles. Those would be the prehierarchical follicles. And then we have our small yellow follicles, right? Then our pre-ovulatory follicles are going to be the bigger ones. And they are arranged, as you see them here, ranked based on their size, right? Their stage of maturation. The largest follicle, which would be this one, will be the first, will be the one that's gonna ovulate next. And then when this one is ovulated, this follicle will be the next number one follicle. 
and that's how they step up. Then you have the post ovulatory follicle, which would be this, and that is basically the empty sac that remains after that yolk is ovulated. All right. Now the the um, labels have moved, but basically they are the follicles are um, develop and they mature in graduated sizes. So the big one would be the F1 follicle. The one next to it, that would be the F2 follicle. This one is the F3 follicle. This one is the F4 follicle. And this one is the F5 follicle. So when the F1 follicle is ovulated, this follicle, the F2, becomes the new F1. And this little follicle right here, this big, um, small, the smallest um, of the big ones, this would now be the F5. So, and that is how they, they, all, they all rotate until they're ovulated. Now remember, not all of these smaller um, whites nor these small yellows will actually develop into the hierarchical F1 to 5 follicles. So ovulation, ovulation is when the ova is released from the ovary, right? That's the term that we use to describe it. We, we call it ovulation. And the structure of the follicle causes that expulsion of the ovum. Now, how does this occur? Now, you can notice there is a distinct line of demarcation on each follicle where there are no blood vessels going across, right? So there are no blood vessels going across. This, there's this line of demarcation. And here, the collagen, the protein structure here is weaker than in the other areas. So whenever that follicle, it's, whenever it's time for it to be released, the, the, um, the follicle actually breaks at that line of demarcation and the membranes rupture and release that ovum and it becomes the yolk of the next egg. All right, so we've looked at ovulation. So that's, that's the role that the ovary pl plays. It um, develops the, the ova or the yolk and releases it through ovulation. Now the oviduct does the rest of the work and primarily, the, of the um, right of a duck will not grow, right? It will not develop. It will just be um, reabsorbed in the body. Sometimes you see them forming a cyst-like structure, but um, there is no production going on in that in that um, section in that of a duck. And sometimes in fast-growing birds like the broiler birds, you'll actually see two of a ducks, but only the right one will be functional. Only the left one, sorry, will be functional. The right one will not be functional. All right, so this is an actual oviduct that we have removed from a, a producing bird and we, we, split, we split it open. So this is the top part of, of that oviduct. That's the infundibulum or the funnel. And the next part, which is the longest part, and I'll talk more about each of these parts as we go along, that would be the magnum. And if you notice, you notice this, the, the, um, the, the surface of it, it's, it's, it produces a lot of mucus, right? And that's where the white is added. And then right here, you have that distinct line of demarcation to, know, to, to notify you that it's a different part, that's the isthmus. And something else is added there. We'll talk about each of that. And then this is the, the shell gland or the uterus goes through the vagina and comes out through the cloaca. All right, so we're gonna talk about the oviduct and its function. The oviduct, so the ovary, the function of the ovary, I want you to remember this is for the development of the ova, right? Or the yolk. Then we go on to the oviduct. And the oviduct has a number of functions. The first one it does, it catches or captures that ovulated ovum. 
right? So when it's released from the ovary, the oviduct catches it. It's like a funnel at the top and it catches that ovum. The next thing, it transfers or transport that, that um, ovum. The oviduct is also where the spermatozoa or the sperm cells are stored if you are breeding birds, right? If you are breeding birds to produce chick, that the, the um, sperm cells would be stored in the oviduct. The oviduct is also the site of fertilization. So if you're going to get chicks, it has to be fertilized in the oviduct. It's also the site of early embryonic development. So the chick starts developing in the oviduct. And for the production of the egg to it's where you have the secretion of the albumin, fluids, shell membrane, the shell, the shell pigment, and the cuticle. So all of that happens in the oviduct. So it has five distinct parts, and the first part is called the infundibulum or the funnel, and that engulfs that ovum or that egg that's coming from the, the, um, the ovary. If that egg is to be fertilized, if you are producing chick, the site of fertilization is in the infundibulum. Now, the next part, which is the longest portion, that part is called the magnum. It's very glandular because it has a lot of um, secretory cells. And that's where you have the formation and the secretion of the albumin, right? That's the egg white. That's where it is released around that egg. The next section is called the isthmus. And that is where the membranes are secreted from and put around that egg. It's not as glandular as the magnum, but it's also glandular because it is a secretory um, organ. Then we have the uterus or the shell gland, and this is a pouch-like tubular gland, right? And water is added to the albumin or pumped up. To, it's the, the egg, when it comes in here, is more like a prune. So then it is pumped up with the water to give it that egg shape. And then this is where calcium is added for shell formation. And if it's a colored egg, this is where the pigment is also added. And then the last part of the, the oviduct is the vagina. And basically, the, the um, purpose it serves is for, it's just a passageway through which the egg is expelled from the, the rest of the re reproductive tract into the cloaca, after which it is laid in your nest. All right, so looking at it again, we're looking at a, a we're looking here at, a, at an actual um, oviduct over here. And if down here, the bottom part of it, there is actually a hard shell that's in that oviduct, right? So this is the uterus, as you would expect. This is the ovary. Now, if we were to, to, to um, stretch it out, it would be this diagram that we have, right? So you have the ovary up here. This is your mature um, ovum that is ready to be ovulated. And you see sitting right under the ovary is the infant belong. And it's opened up waiting for that um, ovum to be released from the ovary. So it is released and it is caught right here. And if it is gonna be fertilized, that's where it is fertilized. And then it begins its journey down the rest of the oviduct. So the next section again is a magnum. And here in the magnum is where the egg white is, is put over that ovum. And there is a structure that's in the egg and we'll see that further on that we call the chalaza. And it's, it's two very um, distinct white sections that you typically, if you break open an egg, 
you'll see these two string-like um, structures at the end of the, or in the, in the egg, if you break it open. And what happens is that as that egg is going down the track, it, it rotates in that reproductive track, like a bullet going through a gun. So it rotates and that rotation caused that, that um, egg white to, to spin into two rope-like structures. And we'll look at that a little more, that anchors that yolk in the egg. So from the magnum, it goes into the isthmus, where the two, the inner shell membrane is added, and then the outer shell membrane is added. And it passes on its way into the shell gland, where shell formation takes place. And this, is, this gland is also um, it's very glandular, and it secretes, it secretes crystals, calcium crystals, which are laid down on that egg to make that shell. It's also the, the part, or right here, number five, that's the uterovaginal junction. And that is where that the sperm cells are stored, right? So the sperm cells are stored in this little junction. When the egg passes out, the the sperms are the sperm cells are squeezed out, or some of them are squeezed out, and they make their way up to the um, infundibulum to await the next um, mature ovum being released, because the fertilization has to take place before anything else is laid on top of that that um, ovum, and then it passes through the vagina, which is basically a passageway, and is expelled or lead via the cloaca. All right, so this slide is showing you the length of each part of that oviduct and basically how much time the egg stays in, in that um, area. So the first part, the infundibulum, only about 11 centimeters um, in length, and the, the yolk will stay there about 0.25 to 0.5 hours before it moves along. Then it goes to the magnum, which as you can see is the longest section. The egg stays there, or the yolk stays there about two to three hours. That's the amount of time it takes to pass through for the, the um, egg white or the albumin to be added. Then it goes on to the isthmus, which is about 10.6 centimeters long. It stays or travels through that area for about 1.25 hours, and then it passes into the uterus, and it stays there for about 20 hours. And then the vagina is about 6.9 centimeters long. It doesn't stay there, it's just a passageway, it just passes through. And then, this is important for you to note, the interval between, between lane and the end ovulation is about 50 minutes. So after that egg is laid, about 15 minutes after another, another ovum is released from that ovary. Right? Now, if you were to add up all of these numbers, you would get more than 24, right? So, and this is, this is approximate, it depends on the bird. So you should not be expecting that a bird will lay an egg every single day, seven days a week, right? It will vary. It takes more than, on average, more than 24 hours for, for an egg to be fully developed and laid. Now, sexual maturity and molting, which we'll talk about, as I said, on Wednesday, can have an influence on the, the ovidult weight and length. An immature pullet, that's what a bird that hasn't started to lay as yet, the weight of that ovidult would just be about 1.1 um, grams compared to a five month old pullet who is in active production at that time, or just at the beginning, sorry, of um, production which would have a, an a oviduct of about 22 grams and a length of about 32. Now, after the first egg, 
that um, weight goes up and the length of the oviduct also increases. And then you look at a hen that's in full mold. That means she's not producing any eggs. Her ovary and her oviduct will regress, right? That means the ovary, the, um, the weight of the oviduct is reduced closer to what a, it would be for an immature pullet. And also the length of it would be reduced being more close, more closely related to that of an immature pullet. All right, so let us now start looking at the structure of an egg. Now from this diagram, you can see at the top we have an ear cell, right? That's an ear cell. And that is, that, that is formed when the two membranes separate and form that little cavity where your ear is. That ear cell is in place in case you, there's a chick there. So when that chick develops, that's where it gets its first breath of air before it starts working its way out of that shell, right? So it, it punctures that air cell with its beak tooth, and then it takes that gasp of air and it can start trying to get out of that cell. So it's, it's there for a purpose. No, it's still there even if that egg is not mature. And the air cell, we actually use that to determine the quality or the freshness of that egg. Then we have the two shell membranes. You have the inner shell membrane and you have the outer shell membrane. Then you have the thin albumin. The albumin that's further away from the yolk is the thin albumin. And the thick albumin is closer to the yolk. Then we have our yolk, we have a germinal disc. If it is fertile, then that disc will start growing. And then we have the chalaza, right? And that's that two rope-like structure that I was telling you about. And outside, you have the shell. So the, the outermost layer is going to be the cuticle. And that's the last thing that goes on that shell before that egg is laid, right? So when it leaves the, the shell gland, the shell is done. If it has a, if it is um, a, a colored egg, it has its, its color on it. Just as it's being laid, as it passes through into the vagina, a cuticle is laid on the top, right? It acts as a lubricant during the laying process, and it also plugs the pores, right? When the shell is developing, it's laid down a crystal at a time, right? So these little structures are crystals, and these crystals grow and form that shell. Now, they will not all form and and close every area it leaves pores in it and that cuticle plugs the pores and that helps to reduce moisture and gas loss from the shell but it will break down over time and it can be damaged if you wash the eggs or if you if you um rub sandpaper on top of it now it's very important in the breeder um, production not to remove that cuticle right because it is to protect the the embryo that's inside of that eggshell for the um table eggs you can wash them i think i spoke about that the last time so you can wash the table eggs it's not as critical for table eggs that are infertile as it is for hatching eggs, which are fertile. So you don't want that cuticle removed. That's why we don't wash our, our hatching eggs, nor do we um, use sandpaper to clean them because we want that cuticle to be in place to help to protect that, that developing um, um, embryo inside of that egg. 
All right, so here we're looking at the shell again. So the color is gonna be determined by the breed or the strain of birds, right? So again, it's composed mostly of calcium carbonate, but there's some sodium, potassium, and magnesium in, in it. And they are crystals which grow, right? So the crystals grow and they, they combine together Sometimes we have the pore spaces in it. And basically it's, it's the package, right? Because you're not eating the shell, you're eating the internal parts of it. So it's a package. And as a result, again, as crystals grow, you have thousands of pores inside of that um, shell. So then we have that shell membrane and it's two fibrous membranes made of protein, right? And they separate to form the air cell. So as, as indicated here in the diagram, that's the inner shell membrane. This is the outer shell membrane. And when they separate, it forms that air cell. And that air cell is formed after the egg is laid, right? So when it is laid, what happens is the, the internal temperature of the bird is much higher than the environment that it's been laid in. So when it is laid and the, as the egg cools, it pulls those two membranes apart, forming that air cell. The air cell also increases as moisture and carbon dioxide is lost from the egg. And that is one way how we can determine if an egg is fresh or not, by looking at that air cell, by candling it. So the bigger the air cell, the less fresh it is or the older the egg is. All right. So the albumin is the white or the clear portion of the egg. When you fry it, it's white. When you break it, it's clear. There are four distinct layers. You have, um, of course, you have the chalaza. You have two different levels of, of thin white, and then you have the thick white. Its primary component is water, but it does contain protein. And it's how you determine, that's one of the ways. You use the yolk to determine the, the egg quality also, but um, the white usually breaks down faster. So um, it's one of the determinations of egg quality. Again, the chalaza, as we call it, the chalaza, is formed from that egg white as it spins, as it travels down in, down the, the, um, the reproductive tract, down the oviduct, and it serves as an anchor. So the yolk is not bouncing all around inside the shell. It's anchored by these two strands of chalaza. All right, so the yolk, which is the most inner part of the of that egg. It has a vitellin membrane which surrounds the yolk that keeps the contents together. It's a good source of, of nutrients and it's contained, it's um, composed of yolk lipids. It's about 65.5% triglycerides, 28.3% phospholipids, and only 5.2% cholesterol, right? And that's just the content of each yolk. Um, the fatty acid composition of the yolk, that's imp influenced by the type of fat that you actually feed those birds. All right. So, we're close to the end. How does a blood spot occur? There are a lot of times, you know, um, people have asked me if a blood spot is an indication of a fertile egg. Well, if it's coming from a facility where there are no roosters, that's not, that would not be the case. The egg would not be fertile, right? A rooster have to be present in order for an egg to be fertile. 
Now, this is how a blood spot is formed. Remember when I spoke about um, the stigma, that line of demarcation where it, um, it, it, it splits open, the protein structure that holds it together splits open and releases that um, ovum into the infundibulum. Now, that line of demarcation should be vascularless meaning there should be no blood vessels running there. Sometimes you have that occurring. So there's a blood vessel that runs across. So when the stigma splits open, of course, it will bleed, that blood vessel will bleed, and it leaves, um, it leaves um, blood spots on that yolk. So that's how you get a blood spot. You can also have meat spots, which could also be a portion of that stigma that tears off and is attached to that um, yolk and it travels with that yolk straight throughout the process. So when you break open that egg, you see that little dull color um, piece of material that's in that, in that egg, that's a meat spot. We also have cases where we have what we call internal layer. Now, if you remember what the infundibulum looked like when I, I showed you that um, drawing of it, how it was set, sitting right under that ovary. Now, it's not attached to the, to the ovary. So there are times when an, an ova, an ovum will actually miss that funnel shape, right? So when it falls, when it is ovulated, it, it doesn't fall into the funnel, but it falls into the, the abdomen or the body cavity of the bird. Remember, it's not, they are not joined together. They are two separate organs, the ovary and the, the oviduct. So it falls and drops into the abdomen portion of the birds where typically the body will reabsorb that that yolk right just like the atresia that occurs from the ovary it reabsorbs that is what you'd want to happen when you have this so sometimes you have this incidence where we call them internal layer where the yolk falls into the abdomen and it does not absorb and this can sometimes lead to to um abdominal infections and then you see that inflammation taking place there. And it can actually, you can actually lose birds this way because it can die from an infection if it's not reabsorbed. Again, the right oviduct typically does not grow, but there are some instances where they will actually form cysts, right? And you mainly see this in birds that are fast growing. Again, the cyst will not develop into a full blown um, oviduct. The ovary will not develop. So still only the um, left side would be functional. What happens when you have two eggs in the oviduct? Well, birds, <clears throat> birds are on a schedule. Right, so they they know when they want to lay, and they typically lay before dark. And this behavior occurs; it, it occurred from birds were wild, right? They wouldn't lay if it was dark, and they couldn't lay in a safe place because they have to save or protect their their um, young ones or their eggs from predators. So. If this, for instance, in this case, if this, this bird has a hard shell eggs in, in the uterus and one plumped and ready to, for shell to be placed on it, it got too late in the day, so then she would not release that, that um, egg that was sitting there. Okay, so that's how you can have two eggs in the oviduct. And sometimes you have double yolk eggs but that mainly occurs when two eggs two yolk are released 
very close together and they end up traveling down that reproductive tract at the same time. Some egg facts I want to leave you with. Again, it will require a hen to um, 24 to 26 hours to produce an egg. Approximately 30 to 50 minutes after the process starts all over again. The shell may have as many as 17,000 pores over its surface, and it's through them the egg can absorb flavors and odors. So how you store your eggs is important, right? So if you store it in, a, in an area where you have onions, it will um, absorb. I'm just trying to keep up. Okay. All right. So it will absorb the odor of things that you have it close to. So that's why it's always um, it's always recommended to store them in the cartons. Then eggs age more in one day at room temperature than one week in the refrigerator. Right? If you remember, um, when the egg dries out. The, the uh, quality of the egg is going to go down or the age, it ages, right? That means the quality of that egg is reduced. So you don't want to, to be storing them in heat. You want them in at least 55 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, and it will keep its quality for a longer period of time. Now, white-shelled eggs are produced by hens that has white feathers and white earlobes. Right, so you can tell what color that shell is going to be by looking at that earlobe on the bird. Right, sometimes you have some white birds birds that has um, red earlobes, so you know that those eggs are going to be brown shelled eggs. Okay, so that's one thing that you can look for with your bird. The egg yolk. That's one of the few food that naturally contains vitamin D. The egg is rich in vitamin D. And guess what the yolk color depends on? It depends on the diet of the hen. So if you feed them substances that are yellow orange, like um, marigold petals, that will make the, the color of the yolk brighter, right? Um, a lot of people always say that Birds that are out in the yard, free range, their yolk color is brighter. Yes, that's true. Because if you're going to buy the feed from the, the, um, the feed store, then they will have more soya bean in it. Soya bean is white, right? So the egg, the, the yolk color is going to be lighter than a bird that's eating greens from the yard in addition to the feed. Okay, so, and occasionally a hen will produce that double yolk egg throughout her egg laying um, career. But you also have some birds that they will constantly be producing these double yolk eggs, not every day, but several times. So a lot of times it's hereditary, right? It's rare, but if it's, um, if you see a bird doing it over and over, it's typically gonna be hereditary and for a young hen to produce an egg with no yolk at all that is not very unusual right because they just started laying and that is it on how to lay an egg thank you very much dr dunkley thank you very much Guys, we're up to 95 participants. If you do have a burning question, please type it into the chat or unmute your mic, ask your question, and then mute your mic again so we don't get the background feedback. So any questions at this time? Hi, this is Darvin. Um, great presentation. I'm just wondering, are we going to, is one of the seminars uh, topics going to be 
the things that affect um, the quantity of eggs that the birds produce. This, this tonight's session was very um, technical and scientific about the actual process of the egg laying. Are we going to get into feed formulations or um, what it is your birds are doing, why they're not laying? Um, is that going to be a topic we'll talk about? Well, we'll talk about some things that will make that um, we'd considered abnormal in the egg production. I don't have, a, we don't have a nutrition, a nutrition um, topic here because typically we suggest that you purchase your feed from commercial producers, commercial um, manufacturers of feed, which would have the correct um, levels of each nutrients that's in that feed. All right, so we typically don't go into talking about what should be in a feed. What, what we'll talk about on, I think it's Wednesday, is different things that you will see in your production that will cause the eggs to be abnormal. And <clears throat> on Thursday, we'll talk about molting, which is one of the, the reasons why your production might be down. And I think I, I had spoken about, I had given a number of different reasons why egg production could be down, why your hens probably stop laying, in, including some that were nutritionally based. So I don't know if that is in the archive. I don't know if Dr. Singh is that archived that if somebody had missed that first presentation, they could go back to that. Yes, yes. So the it's that last seminar was uploaded onto the Ministry of Agriculture's website. So it should be there for viewing. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. How long do laying hens live? <laughs> you want yes. to just, do you want me to read them all together or you want to address them one by one? One by one, yeah. In okay. case I, I don't want to miss any, if I can answer it. Uh, all right. So if you are talking about doing something on a commercial basis, you don't want to keep these hens longer than, say, 110 weeks old, right? So that's over two years. Um, some small flock producers will keep them up to three years because the older they get, the less efficient they will be in, in um, laying the eggs. So even if they can live for the oldest egg, um, hen I've heard about was 26 years old, right? But by that time, that hen isn't laying anything. And if you, if you expect to be, if it's just a backyard hobby, you can keep your birds five years and they'll give you one or two eggs per week. But if you're talking about doing something in order to, to make an economic gain from it, it's not recommended that you keep birds producing over 110 weeks old. I hope that answers the question. Yes. So we have two questions here, and I want us to be very, very clear. And we refer today's topic was primarily for table egg production, which will be unfertilized eggs. So these two questions that I'm going to read off are pertaining to hatching eggs. Mm -hmm. So the first one says, if hatching eggs artificially, wouldn't you have to clean the egg? And what should be the ideal body weight of the hen before mating with the rooster? Okay, so for the hatching, for cleaning of hatching eggs, and we did cover this in the last um, presentation too, um, use a dry cloth to clean those eggs. You don't wash them at all, right? And you don't um, sandpaper them down. You just have to use a dry cloth to try to get off any attaching um, debris. Because if you put an egg that is soiled, like if you realize that the egg is soiled with, with feces, that can't be placed in that incubator because 
as soon as that embryo begins to develop, and remember over time that cuticle is gonna be gone, right? Microbes can enter in that egg and it will kill that embryo. Now, if you leave that in an incubator, that, that um, the microbial growth will be exponential and it can explode in that um, incubator, contaminating all the eggs. So never wash a hatching egg, nor put a dirty egg in an incubator. And what was the other question? Uh, what should be the ideal body weight of the hen before mating with a rooster? It depends on the breed, right? So for say a, a leghorn, a mature hen is about three and a half pounds, right? But when you compare that to say one, a brown bird, they are, they mature, their mature weight is about five and a half to six pounds. So it depends on the breed of the bird. Okay, is it possible to feed hens a forage blend that can help with yolk color? Yes, if that is important for your market, right? So if that is important for the market, yes, you can do that. A little okay. alfalfa meal, but something like um, sunflower seed included in the diet you know, that that will improve that color too. All right, somebody's asking, if you join late, how can we access the recording? Well, this seminar is being recorded and it will be made available through the Ministry of Agriculture's website. Um, any more questions? I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. But my contact information is there. I have received um, questions from the last presentation through my email. So if you haven't thought about anything as yet and you think about it afterwards, there's my email, cdunkley at uga.edu. Okay, somebody just asked a question, Doc. What would be fair to give a red yolk color? Not literally red, I've never seen a red yolk. But I, I'm thinking you would mean a very bright, bright yellow color. You you hardly see that in commercial hens, right? You mainly see that in small flock hens, where we have some we have some producers here which will actually try to formulate their own feed. So if they add sunflower seed in that ration, that will give you a very bright color. And it basically going back to the quest, the previous question, really, if you add, say, alfalfa meal, you'll have that bright color, right? Um, if your birds are in an enclosure and you want to have that bright color, you can feed, you can give them cuttings of grass because birds will pick and eat that grass and see if you, if you get that brighter color yolk. Um, I, I think that's going to be more relevant here because a lot of people in the backyard setting in the Bahamas have their, their chickens in the backyard and maybe pecking on grass. Right. Um, so you'll have a brighter color naturally. Yes. yes. Uh, another question. What can be done to increase the size of eggs? I think that's breed <laughs> age related. It's, it's going to be breed related. And when the bird gets older, there is also there's also um, a, an enlargement of the egg. So as they get older, the eggs will get bigger. And then but, but, it, but it comes with other issues. The egg gets bigger, the shell gets weaker. Okay. Um, Doc, we've, we've, I've visited some farmers here and they've had um, instances of peacocks. So can you speak a little bit about it? About peacocks? Yeah. No. No, where they peck the tail feathers. Okay, they're they're pe pecking. Yeah. Um. Sometimes feather pecking is an indication of some nutritional deficiency, and the best thing to do it's a it's a learned behavior in birds. So as soon as you see any incidents of feather pecking, because they start one one pe pecking at one bird. 
and others come in and start picking at that one bird too. And and you have to be careful to to know what it is if it's if it's really pecking or if it's a a more grooming preening kind of thing. We are seeing incidents here which we call they call it feather feather licking, where birds will be sucking on the feather. They're not really pecking, but they are sucking on the the um the other birds feathers and a number of them will come and they start sucking on it or sucking licking licking or sucking that's what they call it um and that is as a result of vitamin e deficiency and but that's in like a broiler breeder setting where we have seen that we have not seen that in layer setting and mainly because layers are caged here but um if you have an incidence of pecking remove the bird that's been pecked on and allow them to regrow those leaves, those feathers, right? Um, it's easier to do that than try to take the birds who are picking out because birds are very curious. And as soon as blood starts coming, they will cannibalize that bird. So as soon as you see indications of pecking, remove the bird from the, the bird that's being picked on from that um, house. Another question, what, at what age should you remove the heating lamp from chicks? After two weeks, they should be okay. And especially in, in the Caribbean where the temperature mm -hmm. is nice and warm, there is not a lot of um, issues with that. But make sure, because you don't want them to develop a CETES early, make sure in that early first the, the first week or so that they have the right temperature, right? Remember you start at 90 degrees and you gradually reduce it to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, after that two week period, the, the birds are fine. There's a question in here. In the event of a hen getting an abdominal infection from an ovum not being reabsorbed, how can this be treated? Well, with antibiotics. I don't know what antibiotics are available there, but a lot of times you don't know that they have that problem until they die and a necropsy is done. And then you see that that's what happened. Yeah. But it's not, it's, it, it's not that common that it causes that, uh, that um, infection. But um, so you would expect to see a whole bunch of your birds coming up with that. Typically, it is reabsorbed into the body. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I'd like to bring this to a close. Um, we will be sharing the link and the flyer information. We have the next seminar is on Wednesday. We're going to be discussing egg abnormalities, and then on Thursday, inducing a molt in your flock. I know a number of people on this webinar. Are recipients of layer chicks from the Ministry of Agriculture, and I want to urge everyone to try their best to, to log on to these webinars because it is also a form of extension where we educate people on how to manage and grow your layer production here in the Bahamas and through the wider Caribbean, through the other countries that have logged on. Dr. Dunkley, I want to say thank you very much for this very, very, very important session. Even I learned a lot. You are certainly a great teacher. And uh, for the rest of us here in the Bahamas, we will put this up on the website, as I said earlier, so that other people can refer to it and get information as required. Thank you all for participating. Thanks, Dr. Dunkley. Thank you. See you on Wednesday. Yes.